Man, they had me and Jane back there waiting all day. He <laughs> said, Lord. When you're a male, you see, time really is slow. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was just a few minutes, but he says, all no. day. Oh, his minutes are so important. <laughs> yeah, right. Jane's back there going, when the hell are we going out? Come That's on. right, yeah. <laughs> Let's get this show on the road. I've been here long enough now. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> oh, by the way. <laughs> Told you so, we were ready. As you can see, I have my work cut out for me. <laughs> this is either going to be the easiest job or the hardest job this morning. We'll Baby, you're going to have an easy goes. job. Don't worry about it. Um, so you heard the introductions about our, our guests this morning. And I want to put a finer point on the work that they're doing, specifically uh, with Miss Elliott. Uh, we heard about the uh, blue-eyed, brown-eyed uh, experiment that she's done. I, I want to say... Exercise. Her, her workshop exercise. For her work, she's received death threats. She's been hit. She's been threatened with a knife. She um, has been shunned by her various communities. And her family. And her family. <laughs> Damn, Similarly, you play. I'm black, I'm black. You black. I'm black. <laughs> I might as well be. <laughs> Welcome to the family. <laughs> Isn't everybody black? The first person, the first modern human being that evolved on this earth was a black woman. And we're all descendants of that black woman. Now, if you don't, if you don't learn anything else in here today, and if you don't remember anything else, you remember this, there's only one race. There is no black race there. Let me show you something. Well, every person in this room who thinks he or she is a member of the white race, please stand. They're scared as hell. <laughs> That's it, folks. There's only one race, and we all came from a black female, so there's only one race, and it's the black race. Forget all the rest of this nonsense. This has gone on. This has gone on long enough. If we've had enough. I'm sorry. I interrupted you. Sorry Here. about that. <laughs> Told you how we were ready to go. <laughs> Told you it was going to be a bad day. Go ahead. Go ahead with your introduction. Hi. I want to put a, put a finer point on Roland Martin's work as well. And this is serious work. He's written books about faith. He's a civil rights activist. He's a human rights activist. And likewise, he receives death threats. Uh, trolls uh, to his email accounts, his, his website accounts. Folks who do righteous work are a threat to our society. I, I will make, I, I will make, I, I do have to, so I will make one correction. Uh, I am, I do not consider myself to be uh, a civil rights activist. I am a journalist. But as a journalist, 
I am a journalist in the pursuit uh, of truth and justice. Uh, and so when you look at the work, so whether you talk about Frederick Douglass, Ida B. Wells Barnett, when you talk about Robert Abbott, uh, Ethel Payne, those, all these individuals who work within the black press. And I make that distinction because it's important. Mm -hmm. Because I've worked in mainstream media, I've worked in black press. The reason black press, that's critically important because that's where you've seen uh, the most truth. Black press has forced mainstream media to do its job when it comes to these issues. Uh, and so what, hap so what often happens is when we're trying to talk about these issues, what, what happens is when you go into a mainstream environment, uh, the f even the phrase mainstream actually means white. Because they'll say, oh, black media, Latino media, mainstream. I went, well, if that's black, that's Latino, that got to be white. <laughs> and so then the expectation, because seriously, this actually happened in 2007. In 2000, and, and to understand why you, what we're going to talk about, why you experience this, because you have to understand the role of media. Anytime across the world there is a coup anywhere in the world, they get control of the guns first, media second. They get control of the media before the banks. Think about that control of media before the money. So you understand the power of media. When I was at CNN 2007, I did a pilot for a show and I got Senator Barack Obama to agree to come on the pilot, which means it, would never, it was never going to air after he announced he was running for president. During the conversation, I literally talk, I was talking about healthcare and I mentioned the word, I said, man, that hurt a brother when I had to file for bankruptcy because of healthcare costs. Ken Jouts, executive vice president for CNN at the time over HLN, we were meeting. This is literally what he said. He said, uh, uh, be careful using the word brother because we don't want to scare off white viewers. Then he said, I also showed this to my wife. She agreed. I was like, ooh, the white wife agreed. <laughs> now think about that. I'm talking to a black United States senator. I'm using vernacular. Man, that really hurt a brother. Natural. Now Larry King is using phrases that I don't know what the hell he's talking about. Larry King is Jewish, and they were like, oh, that's all good. But think about it. We're going to scare off white viewers. But when Glenn Beck talks about using the word brother as a white evangelical, that's acceptable. So to understand the depths of terms of how media shapes what we think and act every single day, that's why I'm a journalist in the black press, because my job is different, and I bring my blackness to television, whether I'm on CNN, ABC, CNN, it doesn't matter. Sorry. Wait a minute. Please. I'm glad you mentioned Frederick Douglass. <laughs> <laughs> With two S's. Because, is he going to come out? Be, because the fool, the fool is talking to him. Number 45 talks to Frederick Douglass. He says Frederick Douglass is doing some great things. <laughs> That bothers me a lot. If he can talk to Frederick Douglass, I want him to talk to my husband. <laughs> I'm sorry, go on. I want to take you back to 2007. Your book had just come out, Listening Within the Spirit, right? Yeah. Okay. You were talking at that time about the number of faith-based marches, protests that were happening. You talked about this on CNN.com. You did some interviews about this. And one of the things that you said was, because this is the Women of Color Task Force, right? So we're going to talk about women for a minute. That's fine. One of the things that you said that was missing from those marches, those protests, were, was attention to um, police brutality, attention to AIDS, attention to um, poor education in our communities. What is the role of women, uh, women's responsibility to those issues when we're thinking about those marches? Let's fast forward exactly 10 years later, 2017, we had the, the Women's March on Washington. Mm -hmm. What say you about what was happening in 2007 and what was happening in 2017 and their attention to those issues well, first or the of, lack of? Well, first and foremost, when, when I look at, when you talk about the role of women, and then when you talk about organizations, you also still have to deal with this race construct. So I'll use the example of what took place in McKinney, Texas, when the young girl was body slammed by the police officer to the ground of the pool party. Uh, white women were silent. Mm -hmm. the, the first response to that were civil rights organizations, uh, were black female organizations, but the National Organization for Women, silent. I blasted them on my air. 
Three hours later, they released a statement. Ever since then, anything happened to a black woman, they released a statement within 10 minutes, because they like, look, <laughs> we know what he's going to say. Now, 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 why, now, why is that important? Because the same thing in 2007. Historically, what has happened is issues that have involved black women now has been silent. I'm absolutely silent. So the question then becomes, okay, are you the National Organization for Women or the Na National Organization for White Women? The same thing, Concerned Women for America, conservative organization. Uh, they, are, they were protesting, uh, the, there were a couple of female uh, conservative judges who, who they were trying to get appointed, and they were pushing Democrats on that. I said, I'm sorry, when Cheryl Watley was appointed by Bill Clinton to the North Texas federal bench, y'all were silent. I said, so don't call yourself Concerned Women for America if you're only concerned about conservative white women. The reason I'm laying that out is because when you talk about these issues, you can't say uh, we want to speak to women's issues, but then you exclude other groups and then how they are impacted. And so, that, so that's one of the issues there. Women play a central role. Black women voted at, the higher, at a higher rate than any other group in 2008 and 2012. Higher than white men, black men, Latinos, everybody. So when you talk about those concerns, well, are you putting their specific issues on the table or is that sort of a side conversation? And that's the struggle that we have in this country. If you're gonna say we're advancing the cause of women, it needs to be women, not a certain group of women. Let's get Jane in on this. Jane, advancing the cause of women, not certain groups of women. Can you talk a little bit about what you saw we, in the March on Washington? We have been advancing the cause of white women ever since the women's movement. The women's movement was a movement for white women. They might as well have been wearing placards that said, black women need not apply. And that was only allowed to happen is because we wanted to stop the civil rights movement. And white men went along with that in order to put a stop to the civil rights movement. As long as we're talking about the the rights of white women, then we don't have to talk about the rights of people of other colors. As far as I'm concerned, that's what the, white, the women's movement was about. Now there's going to be another women's movement. You need to realize this. If you haven't read Ben Wattenberg's book, The Birth of Earth, you need to realize that in this country right now, we've got a whole lot of white folks are scared to death because they know that within 30 years, white people will have lost their numerical majority in the United States of America. And if you haven't read that book in which he says, the biggest problem confronting this country today is there are too few white babies being born in this country. If we don't solve this problem and solve it quickly, white people will lose their numerical majority and this will no longer be a white man's land. Now, now I know a whole lot of Native American people, of First Nations people, who don't think this is a white man's land. They think it's a... <laughs> He, sa he says there are three, ways, things, three things we can do to solve this problem. Number one, we can, allow, we can increase, no, number one is we can pay women to have babies as they have been doing in Western European nations for years. Then he says, unfortunately, and these are his words, not mine, unfortunately, we would have to pay women of all colors to have babies, so we don't want to do that. Now, this man was a member of the American Enterprise Institute, an ultra-conservative right-wing think tank, and gave advice to presidents of the United States. He says the second thing we could do is allow more, increase the number of legal immigrants allowed into this country every year. Then he says, unfortunately, we would, the, the majority of people who want to come to this country today are people of color, so we don't want to do that. He says the third thing we could do, and this is really scary, is realize that 60% of the fetuses that are aborted every year in this country are white. If we could keep that 60% alive, that would solve our birth dearth. Now, how many of you think that sounds like blatant, overt racism? People, you need to know that the attempt to get rid of my white right or any other woman's right to have an abortion is not about religion, it is not about morality, it is about keeping white people in the numerical majority in this country, and you better realize that's what's happening right now. Right now, they are trying to pass legislation, and the pre Mr. 45 and his underlings, <laughs> I refuse to say his name, because if I do, I'll have to call him what I call him, which is Donosaurus T. Rum. <laughs> oh dear, is this being televised? Oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> That's all right, I'm tired of working anyway. <laughs> 
people, they're trying to outlaw abortion. They're trying to tell women once again what they can do with their bodies. If a woman has to be punished for having a, by, by getting pregnant, whether or not she wants to, has to be punished by bearing that child, then the person who contributed to that unwanted pregnancy has to be held responsible for two. So I think there's a, hey, 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 wait, don't waste my time. There's a perfectly logical, <laughs> there's a perfectly logical, there's a perfectly logical uh, remedy for this problem. Any male who contributes to an unwanted pregnancy must submit to involuntary vasectomy so that he cannot contribute to another unwanted pregnancy. Now, now people, you need to know that vasectomy takes only a few minutes in the doctor's office. It isn't very painful. My husband's vasectomy didn't hurt me at all. Now, <laughs> You also need to realize that vasectomy is reversible. Motherhood is not reversible. Once you're a mother, you are a mother for as long as you live. That's the way it is. Even if you give that child up for adoption, you still hear that child crying in the night and you wonder how he or she is getting along. People, vasectomy is reversible. Young males could have a vasectomy and have a lot of fun without a whole lot of responsibility. And then when they want to pre produce a child, when they want to contribute to a wanted pregnancy, then they could have that vasectomy reversed. How many of you think that would be a logical conclusion to this problem? <laughs> now, now, some of you, now some of you are going to say, she doesn't like men. Oh, yes, I do. I don't dislike you. <laughs> Boy, I do. <laughs> However. You need to know, I don't dislike men. Some of my best friends are men. <laughs> How many of you have heard something like that before? Uh-huh. I'm sorry, go ahead. Roll it. When, it, when, we, talk about, when, we, when we talk about these differences, uh, it, it's very interesting for me how we are in complete denial of how we even got here. Um, and when I often speak around the country, I tell people to understand uh, this country in all different pieces, you use the example of uh, a house being built. How many of you have ever uh, had a house built from ground up? Okay. Which is different from buying an existing house. So when you talk about a house built, being built from ground up, uh, I've had the fortune of seeing literally in Texas, where I'm born and raised, na what literally cities constructed. So I, I saw an area, nothing there, then all of a sudden they come in, they drop power lines, sewer lines, all of those things. So all these things happen before even a foundation is laid. So let's say all those things happen, all of a sudden now you do a foundation. If you wanna show a badly constructed house, you typically don't know that until after the house is being built. Because then you see the cracks in the crown molding, the cracks in the walls, because the foundation is bad. So to understand where we are today in America when it comes to sexism, when it comes to racism, when it comes to whether, when it comes to even within women, uh, this notion of, well, I don't like you and I like you, in terms of this balance existing between black women and white women, the exact same thing happens uh, in the LGBT community. Uh, I've done stories on the segments on this on my show where African Americans have talked about uh, the rampant racism that exists in the LGBT movement, in the so-called equality movement, there's tons of inequality. Tons. Now, I'm not gay, but I've had brothers and sisters who are same gender loving on my show talk about the battles that they have had with other folks who are white and gay because their whiteness was more important than their gayness. So you have to understand how a house is constructed. So the cracks that we see, the reason we have the cracks in this foundation called America is because of how the foundation the problems are on our foundation. So you go back to literally how we, how we started and see when we talk about these laws today in our country, we never say, wait a minute, when did that law get enacted and what was the root cause behind it? We were talking last night and I was talking about Governor Terry McAuliffe when he provided uh, the voting rights for uh, 13,000 formerly incarcerated people. That law in Virginia was put in place when a state legislator said in 1902, we are doing this to keep the darkies from voting. So Virginia was defending a law for more than 100 years where the basis was a white legislator saying, we're going to keep the darkies from voting. So what happens is we never want to ask ourselves, 
where did this come from? How did we even get to this point, which explains the struggle we keep having because we want to say we live in a post-racial America, everything is great, white folks listen to hip hop, black people listen to some country music, and everything is great. <laughs> Beyonce performs at the Country Music Awards. Everybody is happy and wonderful until you look at the comments on the Country Music Association's website. So, so we have to actually look at ourselves and go, how did we get here and how does this generation change where do we go in the future because we're playing games if we only are having these nice cute conversations but then we go home to largely white homes largely black homes we don't invite others into our home we don't eat with other people we don't talk with other people but we say oh i'm not racist i get along with everybody many of us are living lies every single day i like to think I'd Killer, like to talk Killer to Mike you. Killer Mike was in my house a year ago. <laughs> How many of you know who Killer Mike Render is? I do. Oh my God. <laughs> was the thing? The rest of them are going, you had dinner with a Killer Mike? <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> now, folks, it's, somebody has said denial is not just a river in Egypt. In this country today, we are in deep denial about the fact that we are deeply racist. We are teaching racism in the schools on a daily basis. And if you haven't read Nathan Rutstein's book, The, Psycholo the Racial Conditioning of Our Children, you need to get it and read it. This man knows what knew what he was talking about. Now, somebody said this morning, he did, well, Jane came here in a sweatshirt. Yes, I came here in a sweatshirt, people, because I'm working, number one. Number two, this thing says exactly what I believe. Racism, prejudice is a, an emotional commitment to ignorance. Now, the problem with white people is not white innocence. Somebody this week has called it, in a book has called it white innocence. It's not white innocence, and it's not white privilege. It's white ignorance, and until white people get educated to the fact that they are not superior because of the lack of melanin in their skin, that's how long we'll have this problem. And we could, we could, don't do that, don't do that, I've got more to say. <laughs> We could change this problem if we would start educating instead of indoctrinating in the schools. We are indoctrinating children instead of educating them. I'm an educator. The word educator comes from the root duck deuce, which means lead, the prefix e, which means out, the suffix ate, which means the act of, and the suffix or, which means one who does. I am one who is involved, engaged in the act of leading people out of ignorance. And you can't do that by teaching antisocial studies, which is what we're doing in this country today. Now, let, now let me, let me, now, now here's, here's why that phrase white ignorance is so important. Because the problem with white privilege, and because, uh, and, and, and I said I was a journalist, when I interviewed Maya Angelou, she says, no, you're an educator. And I went, right. oh, okay. really? Okay, she said, no. We are all she educators. said, no, you are, I watch you. You educate every day. I was like, okay, cool, Maya. Uh, <laughs> Maya Angelou said it, I'm an educator. So, so I live in words. Words mean something to me. So the part, part, part of the problem with white privilege is that we have been conditioned to think that privilege means you probably live in a gated community, you probably drive uh, an Aston Martin or Rolls Royce, uh, and then you play uh, croquet or polo. That, that's what we think in terms of privilege. The problem, but what happens though is, what I try to explain to people that you might be uh, uh, broke as hell, can't read white in West Virginia, but the reason you have, what you say, white privilege, is that you get to go to a department store and not be followed around. You might be the brokest person in the world, and I might, be, I might be in the top 1%, but you get to actually do some things that I cannot do, and we're so-called free in this country. To also put it in its proper context, 20-odd Africans arrived in 1619, in Virginia. You go through this period of slavery. Go to 1863, Emancipation Proclamation, 12 years of Reconstruction, Great Compromise of 1877, takes us all the way through uh, the Civil Rights Movement, World War I, World War II, then you go through the 13 years of the Black Freedom Movement. If you use 1970 as the marker when African Americans were technically fully free Americans, when I say fully free, meaning we could work anywhere, live anywhere, eat anywhere, but that's technically because we still had lawsuits since that point. But let's just say 1970. That means in 398 years of America, black folks have only been technically 
fully free Americans 47 years. Follow me here. I'm 48. I was going to say, and how old are you? I'll be 49 in November, which means I was born into an America where I was not born fully free. My wife and I don't have any biological children. My brother and my, my sisters do. That means that my nieces and nephews, the first generation of African Americans born technically fully free. I'm saying that because you must understand that because when folks say, oh, slavery was just so long ago, but I've met individuals who were the first African Americans who went into corporate America in 1971. 89% of the electorate who voted for the president in 1972 were white. 89%. This year, it was 70%. The 2020 election will be the first time in American history less than 70% of the total electorate is white. That's important because now you begin to step back and go, wait a minute, hold up. So you're trying to tell me, although slavery ended this, that, uh, 1863, Emancipation Proclamation, which was a lie only in those states that succeeded. And then, of course, it's also a lie because the 13th Amendment was passed and the word slavery still sits in the 13th Amendment if you go to the prison system. So now all of a sudden you begin to understand how all these pieces begin to fit. And then you say, oh. So now I want to see the Brandeis study. The average white family has $110,000 in wealth. The average black family has $5,000 in wealth. And the average Americans are able to get their wealth from home, own, from home ownership. Then you understand from the Federal Housing Authority when they use the federal, when use the federal system to prevent black folks from owning homes and redlining. And then if you were white, you were able to get a home. White soldiers had the GI Bill after World War II. Black soldiers couldn't. And then if you did have the GI Bill, you still couldn't go work in some other places. So you literally see the construction. So people go today, why is it these black folks cannot save money? It's because it was rooted in our system where we could not. And then we just saw the home foreclosure crisis where if you were black, you qualify for a prime loan, but you got a subprime loan. And in the last eight years, 53% of all black wealth was wiped out gone due to the home foreclosure crisis. So to say, well, say, well, why are our communities looking this way? Why are most black neighborhoods looking this way? How was that black neighborhood created? Easy, a red line was drawn and it said, don't invest in it, they can't own, don't put, don't put resources in it. And then we sit here today and go, why can't those blacks get their stuff together? You have on your website these kinds of statements where you prompt us. Let me see if I wait can find Wait a minute, wait sure. a minute, wait a minute. Okay, all right. I didn't realize how young you are. <laughs> and I'm not gonna hold it against you because you know a lot. <laughs> However, Martin Luther King Jr. was killed. Next year it'll be 50 years yep. since his death. And can we correct the record? Because I think we said 35 years. It has been 50 years it since you've yeah, been doing this It will be 50 years work. next year yep. since Martin Luther King. 24 hours after King's assassination, you started this work in your third grade you classroom. You were just a gleam in your father's eye at that time, okay? <laughs> no, 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 no. When he was killed, Mama was two months pregnant. I was a Valentine's Day baby. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> I was and born a, November 14th. And a hearty welcome. Nine months to earlier you. was February 14th. <laughs> okay, all right. All right. Okay. What's your question? I know what happened on Valentine's night <laughs> in 1968. Go. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> I tried to tell you. She's like, I got this. I'm like, yeah, okay, I heard that before. Yeah, but you're in a different context when you heard that. Go ahead, go ahead. No. So I want, what I want to do is, he, he talked about the structures of racism. You have been doing this work for 50 years. But he's been you, living this for 50 years. He has been living this There's for 50 years. There's a big difference. Yes. I can talk about it because I don't have to live it. You have to live it. You need to understand that my heroes, and don't ever call me a heroine because that's not what I am. My heroes are black women. Black women keep on keeping on regardless of all the obstacles we put in their paths. And, and I'm not, I don't just say this to you because you're a largely black audience. I say this to every audience that I talk to. You have to realize that you, you were here first and you will be here last. Because us white folks are going to go out in the sun and it's going to get worse and worse because of <laughs> 
and we're going to die of melanoma. So you will be here long after we're gone. You are going to be the majority in this country very, very shortly. So get ready for it, because you're going to take, you think you've been abused before. Wait until you get the power, that you have the power to do what you choose to do. And that's the problem. White mm -hmm. folks are scared to death that if people of color get power, they'll, they're going to want to do to us what we have done to them. Now, how many of you want to get even with all white folks? <laughs> how many of you want to get even with one or two? <laughs> yeah. All we white folks have to do is work very, very hard to be sure that we aren't the one you want to get even with. <laughs> what we do in the present constructs the future. That's right. Blacks right. are not responsible for the past. Whites are not responsible for the past. We are, the re we are all responsible for what we do in the present to construct the future for our children and our grandchildren. And you, uh, stop that, stop that, stop that. We don't have time for that. You need to know that as far as I'm concerned, we're all related. We're 30th to 50th cousins, every person in this room. You are all related to me. Now, you might not like being related to me, but you are. You are my relatives, and I will not tolerate having my relatives abused because of somebody else's ignorance about skin color. And that's what we're talking about in this country. That's right. And let me, let me, let me, and, and see, again, when, when, these, when these studies and things are released, we, we recite them on television, and again, many of my white colleagues don't even remotely think beyond just what it is. So get a perfect example. Um, 2009, John Avalon, John Avalon and I were at CNN waiting to go on the air, and I said, John, we are right now in the beginning stages of what I call white minority resistance. I said, although the numbers don't show it, that's where we are. I said, the election of President Obama is about to reveal America's true feelings. Now here's what the deal, people are saying, oh, but there were a lot of white folks who voted for Obama. Yes, but, to the, but go behind the numbers. And so, to, so Pew does a annual survey, and the question is asked, are you optimistic, optimistic about the future of America for your children? In 2009, African Americans had the highest optimism, Latinos were second. Every other, every, every group, blacks, Hispanics, Asians, Native Americans, every group, more than the majority said yes. Only one group was less than the majority. In September, another study comes out. Are you optimistic about the future of America economically for the next 10 years? African Americans, lowest wealth, had the highest optimism at 58%. Latinos, second lowest wealth, second highest optimism. Whites in America, highest Highest average wealth per family at $110,000, only 41% said they were optimistic about the future of America for the next 10 years for their children. I then went, why? It is because we've changed so much that white ignorance or white privilege now means your boy can't tell his boss to hire my son or my daughter. Now, white kids in America have to compete. That this is real. Why did, uh, last name Fisher, I forgot her name because I wasn't trying to memorize it. Why did she sue the University of Texas? She, well, I had to, did she come here? Yeah, she came here. So she sued, <laughs> I'm sorry. She sued the University of Texas because she said, I couldn't get in because it was those minority students. That's why I couldn't get in. My grades were so superior, and I know their grades were lower. But then what happened? Went through the court system, go before the Supreme Court. Then the evidence comes out that there were white students who had lower grades than her, but they got in. And then it was kind of like, damn, we can't blame on black people and Latino people. <laughs> and it never occurred to her that you have to do more to get into school than just study. But in her whiteness, she said, oh, it's gotta be them. It was a competition thing. So what's happening is you have white mothers and fathers who are now afraid to death because they have not raised their white children to know how to compete. They now are going up against post-civil rights movement babies 
who are now second generation post civil rights movement babies who coming out of the womb were raised, you're gonna be twice as good, you're gonna do whatever you need to do. Black women, black women go, are going to college at a higher rate than anybody else. America kept throwing, to Jane's point, America kept throwing obstacles in black folks' way. They were like, okay, cool. All right, gold now is 14 feet. Okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go. Black folks said, I'm gonna go practice, I'm gonna go work out, I'm gonna come back, and I'm gonna dunk this goddamn ball at 14 feet. <laughs> and then they went and trained, came back, dunking at 14 feet, and it's like, oh, the new height is now 16 feet. Black folks like, All right, I'm gonna go train. I'm come gonna dump this goddamn ball at 16 feet. That has been the black experience. And so the reason that number is 41% because it is white fear of the future. It's the ability to be able to get guaranteed jobs, get guaranteed loans. And, 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 that's, and that's why the election was what it was here in Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania because there is this fear when you hear I want the America, I read this story the other day, a guy in Erie, Pennsylvania, I want the America like it was for me when I got out of school and got a manufacturing job so my kids can get a job. Bruh, that world is gone. He wants 1972 America when we were only just two years removed from the civil rights movement. And that's the fear. And the people say, but oh no, no, I'm not racist. No, the point is, you grew up a certain way and you want that America, but you want to deny what that America was for people who look like me. And that's, and that's, so this is not a four year struggle, what's gonna happen in the 2020 election. No, what Jane said earlier, we are in a 30 year war, folks. 2044 will be the year when America changes when it comes to no one group. This is not going away. You're gonna see this battle all across America because of fear, but, fear of a changing nation. But it doesn't have to be a battle. Precisely. If we would start educating people, and those of you who believe this crap of white superiority, you need to educate yourselves. For the love of heaven, get the book, The Myth of Race by Robert Wald Sussman. If you haven't read that book, you don't understand that there really is only one race. We don't have to have this battle if we would don't simply realize that you and I are all members of the same race. There's only one. You're valuable human beings because you were born on the face of the earth. Skin color does not indicate intelligence or lack of it. You need to realize that. It doesn't indicate abil ability or disability. It is not, should not be a problem unless you're going to look at people who are less colorful and say to yourselves, well, you haven't been here long enough to know from a good grade of clay because most white folks don't. We don't know because we haven't, we have been, instead of being educated, we have been indoctrinated. And, and you're going to say, well, wait, white people are the only racist people. You know as well as I do that people of color are racist too because you all took the same social studies. Yep. You yep. all learned the same nonsense. You all know that if you're too dark, that's too bad. And if you're too light, that's too bad. There's no way you can win in a situation where we are, we are judging people on the amount of melanin in their skin. It is ridiculous. It makes no sense. It needs to be stopped. You know it and I know it. And even this man who's a whole lot younger than I am knows it. <laughs> He can't help his age, folks. He'll get old if he's lucky. <laughs> and if you're lucky, I won't get much older. But we, <laughs> we could fix this if we chose to. If we chose to say, no more. We will not tolerate this anymore. No more. And the reason right. we have this number 45, who's really about 43 and a half, the only reason we have that man is because it's a reaction to eight years of a black man in the White House. Now. I remember, I remember, if you'd stop doing that, I'd get more said here, okay? <laughs> I remember when Ronald Reagan said, the reason we have such high unemployment in this country is because of all the women in the workforce. You don't remember that, I do. You aren't old enough to remember that, I am. I also remember when Richard Nixon said to a group of white reporters, I'm trying to save the White House for you white people. Now people, 
this is nothing new. This is something that has been here. We have been teaching it for a whole lot of years. You need to realize that 500 years ago, all of a sudden, after the Spanish Inquisition, somebody listened to Linnaeus, who categorized plants according to their likenesses and differences, and said, if that'll work with plants, it'll work with people. It doesn't work with people, and it's time to put a stop to it. We could stop it if we chose to. This is nonsense. This is the, this is the mark of an uncivilized society. You need to become a civil society and, and, people. And it's vital, it's vital that, again, when you understand, again, history. I, I, it's unbelievable to me when I hear these debates about affirmative action. First of all, the greatest, first of all, the greatest affirmative action program in American history uh, has, was Social Security and uh, the GI Bill. And that did not benefit black people. Uh, the second, was the affirmative action program put in by Arthur Fletcher under President Richard Nixon, and the greatest beneficiary has been white women. MWBE, Minority Women Business Enterprise. You look at most of these contracts, I don't care, pull it out any state, more than likely women are getting a larger share than any other minority group. The black women are under the black category, Hispanic under the Hispanic category, Asian under the Asian category, so W really means white women, it should be WW. So it's amazing to me when I see people, I mean, I did this when I was at Texas A&M in one of my uh, speech communications classes, uh, and uh, I, I talked about affirmative action. I said, how many of you have mothers with businesses? And hands went up. I said, how many of you, uh, not only black kid in the class, I said, how many of you with mothers and they're getting government contracts? Hands went up. I said, congratulations, affirmative action is paying for your college. <laughs> and they looked at me like I was crazy. Like, what the hell are you talking about? And so I had to explain to them the reality of affirmative action. But here's the other reality. And liberal white women do this as well, and it's just, again, not having a clue. So how many of you have heard of Title IX? How many of y'all thought, think that Title IX was about sports? <laughs> Title IX was not about sports. Title IX was about opening professional schools to women. You saw the explosion of female doctors and dentists and lawyers and engineers and architects and all these professors after Title IX was passed. Can somebody tell me where Title IX is from? Title IX is coming, is a section of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So women, largely white women, you have been benefiting from the opening of professional schools because black folks were marching to get the 64 Civil Rights Act. If you are disabled, and you love who is disabled in the American with Disabilities Act. Where did that act come from? The 1964 Civil Rights Act. Who's gay and is happy, or who's happy about same-sex marriage? It's called the 14th Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause. That was a Reconstruction Amendment. So I've just outlined multiple ways many Americans have benefited from the work of black people. So you have people walking around opposing Civil Rights Act, not even realizing that they are benefit. If you are, if you don't speak a language, if you don't speak English and you're voting and your ballot is in Vietnamese or some other language, you should thank black people because that's the result of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. The point I'm making is, in the history of America, and you can go back and check it during the Reconstruction period, poor whites benefited even more than poor black people during the 12 years of Reconstruction because the laws that were being passed to so-called help free slaves help poor illiterate whites as well, and they were voting against their own economic interests when Jim Crow came in because they lost out as well. White, white poverty dropped after, with the war on poverty after 1968 because of the efforts of African Americans fighting for that. If white folks in America will realize that if you broke and black folks are broke, you broke. <laughs> and if we are working together and it's about the issues in our economic condition, but we're getting played because folks who are rich are saying, now look, now we white. They black. And we do this thing together. We gonna keep them from getting jobs. Now we keep all those Latinos out of America, then you can get more jobs. The same fool who is telling you that is the same one who is hiring illegal immigrants and paying them three dollars. 
And folks are going, yeah, you right. So we're going we gonna to throw them out and we're going to build a wall and then we're going to keep all the jobs. No, they still going to pay your ass less. <laughs> But, but if you're broke, if you're broke as a white person, it's become of a, it's because of affirmative action, and they're calling it reverse discrimination. Right. There is no such thing as a reverse discrimination, people. It's not reverse discrimination. It's delayed justice. <laughs> it has gone on long enough. Right. If you're broke as a white person, it's too bad we can help you. If it's a, if you're broke as a bad as a black person, it's because you're too damn lazy to get a job. Boom. You know that, and I know that. That oh. is what is going on in this country because we are miseducating the American mind. We need to change the educators. We've got to re-educate the educators because they believe all this crap too. They really yep. think. Yep. They really think that Black history began with slavery. They really believe that that's when Black history began because they haven't read Browder's. Nile Valley's contributions to civilization. And if you haven't read it, you get it and you read it. And then take that to school and tell those teachers to say, wait a minute, instead of having a Black History Month, we're going to have Black History every day of the year in school. That's the way it ought to be. I'm sorry, go ahead. I, What's I got, your next I, question? I, I, I do have to thank racism for one thing. I, I, and there's one place where racism has really helped black people. Okay, y'all saw all those town halls in Connecticut and Virginia and New Hampshire when all these white folks were crying about their, their, their family members dying because of heroin overdoses? Okay, and that's because of prescription drugs? Okay, this is where racism really helped black people. So doctors across America, uh, the reason black people are prescribed painkillers at a lower rate than whites is because white doctors feared that black people were coming to the doctor to get painkillers because we were drug addicts. So white doctors said, we're not gonna prescribe these black people painkillers. So white people are dropping dead across America because of these painkillers. So to all of the white racist doctors, thank you. <laughs> black people are not hooked on painkillers and we're not dropping dead, and y'all might think this is, but understand, Time Magazine had the story about three or four months ago. The white, the, the white life expectancy has dropped because of the opioid epidemic. And because we living longer, they're living shorter. In fact, the white death rate, to her Jane's point earlier, about white births, in about five years, in about six or seven states, the white death rate will surpass the white birth, annual white birth rate in those states. One of the reasons why the, why the numbers are changing and why it's going down. But the, the prescription drug thing is a perfect example of how racism works, where literally doctors said, oh, no, no, they're here to get high. So, no, y'all take aspirin, or you take a leave, or you take Advil, but we're gonna, we're gonna prescribe this white person over here with healthcare. Oh, y'all gonna get the Oxycontin, y'all gonna get all the powerful drugs, and then what happened? They get hooked. Then the insurance runs out. Now they're trying to score heroin on the street. When you're seeing these news stories of in Cleveland, 38 people last night overdosed on heroin, those were not 38 black people. <laughs> Again, you see how racism works even in our healthcare system. And that, and th and that, that literally happens. So I appreciate that, Biggest. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> appreciate that. What was your question? <laughs> Go ahead, ask, ask one, we can do this. Let, let, let's do something different. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about what's in the headlines. All right. Okay. Um, Kellyanne Conway. Oh, no, 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 I'm not gonna talk about Kellyanne Conway. I don't, you know, skeletons with that hair. Don't do it for me, no, I'm not talking about Kellyanne. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <coughs> Get your damn feet out the couch. Sit down and shut up. <laughs> but was it really... Feet in the couch. Just be quiet a minute. Was it, was it really about her feet on the couch? Is that the issue? We reduced it to a feet on the couch issue. But what was that photo really about? 
I don't what know. Was I, the album? Quite frankly, okay. I don't pay any attention to Kelly Ann Con- Kelly Ann Conway because I think she's a nutcase. But uh, so her feet on the couch that has no. I haven't been following her feet on the couch. Hey, babe, I got you right here. As I said, I'm not interested in Kelly Ann Conway's feet or anything else. <laughs> so Trump met with the black historically black college presidents. And so she's sitting there, legs open, feet in the couch. Guess why office. her legs are open. Should we talk about that? <laughs> Don't go there. No, 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 no. Mine are crossed. <laughs> Mr. Martin. <laughs> Rachel, I've, I've got a... We're going to throw out some names. Go ahead, Kellyanne. <laughs> Rachel Dolzel. Oh, yeah. Well, here's the deal. Here, okay, all right, all right. So, Rachel Dolezal is a white Dolezal. woman who wanted to be a black woman. <laughs> but, but, right, and she, and she just, and she just changed and she her changed name her to, name. A, to, a, to an African name. Uh, she's trying to be a Kardashian. You're I mean, because I mean, skill. that doesn't take any didn't, skill. Didn't didn't didn't, <laughs> didn't didn't Kylie Jenner all of a sudden uh, get some full lips and now she's selling a whole full lip line? Uh, didn't Kim Kardashian? First of all, none of their butts are real. <laughs> but but again, to under but again to understand American history, if you look at uh, Skip Gates in one of his uh, one of the documentaries uh, that was at the university, I believe it's in this state. Uh, where I forgot the, the campus, where they have a museum that's dedicated to all of the images. Huh? It's right north. Got it. So they have a, have a museum, all, well, all of these images, uh, to, that shows how, uh, how media has been used to portray African Americans. So black women have had larger hips, larger butts, fuller lips, hair. America has said for centuries, oh, that's offensive, that's, that's, that's horrible. Now all of a sudden, a non-black woman discovers a butt, <laughs> and now everybody wants a big ass. <laughs> it was no different in the 70s when Bo Derrick got braids. Oh, Lord. You had white women all across the country getting them some braids with some beads. <laughs> and so, Ameri- but, so, what, what, so, but it's no different than when Pat Boone was singing music, and it really were black artists, and then they were covering those songs. Elvis ain't the damn king. Little Richard is. Chris Rock said, Chris Rock said this, and, and, but it's a sort of the same thing. Chris Rock said this uh, when he said, he said, John Stewart can perform in front of 4,000 people. Kevin Hart can perform in front of 40,000 people. Well, Kevin Hart has to cross over. So what you have here is you have, again, these standards. You have these standards. The reason this photo has gotten the level of tension it has gotten, it is because of white female in an office, legs open, and all these black men standing around the Oval Office. That's why it's gotten this much attention. So to be clear, it is not about the feet on the couch. That oh, isn't. Oh, no, no, that, that, what, what, is, what is deeply embedded in America is th- that's sort of where this sort of reaction is coming from. And it's under, it is still understanding our history. It's just understanding the history of this country. Uh, and so, I mean, I, frankly, for me, it's been much ado about nothing. Uh, with the photo. I have, I, I, I have not discussed it on my show. I got a, a, a more important stuff to talk about. But it's just understanding there are racial triggers in America. We see a photo, we see something, and all of a sudden, it clicks. Uh, it's no different than when, if you are African American, so for instance, Serena and Venus, two of the most dominant athletes, not women, That's not right. women, athletes, which includes men, all of a sudden, they have been branded their entire careers. They're arrogant. They are, um, uh, every term being used. Uh, same thing, Tiger Woods, exact same thing. Now, Tiger don't know he's fully black, but, um, <laughs> but sort of the same thing. 
And what we have to understand these standards, how they are different. So I'll do it this way. So if you are, it happened to me when I was uh, in at the Fort Worth Star Telegram, I was 20, I was 25. Another reporter, Ken Delaney, was 25. I covered city hall, he covered county government. I'm black, he's white. Ken was assertive. Ken was aggressive. Ken was a go-getter. We were the exact same age. Ken made more mistakes than I did. Had to have more corrections in the paper. I was arrogant. You were an uppity. I was, yes, I was uppity. I was, uh, why do you have to be, uh, why do you have to be so forceful? And I'm going, I'm sorry, can I get the titles he got? <laughs> now, I, but, I, but I need y'all to understand how this thing plays out, okay? So let's just say uh, I'm here. You call me those things, which then means you're limiting my ability to get promotions which then means you're limiting my ability to have more income, which then means you're limiting my ability to create wealth, which then means you're limiting my ability to be able to invest. You're limiting my ability to take those investments to then create trust. Then you're limiting my ability to create a trust and then provide for my nine nieces and four nephews which means that your singular decision to call me arrogant today has a direct impact on my family two to three generations from now. That's how deep this thing plays. So, if I, when, I'm, so when I'm fighting, same as when a woman is fighting for equal pay, it's the exact same thing. You're not fighting just for your equal pay. You are actually fighting for the wealth creation for your children's children's children. So this thing is not just about you today. That's, that's when generational wealth comes in and that's how deep this thing is. I want to get Jane in on this conversation about womanhood, right? That these are the experiences that he's talking about universally but it isn't exactly the same in mapping onto what, what the women's experience is and what womanhood is about and how we navigate that. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, we could if I chose to. <laughs> <laughs> but the black female experience is not the same as the white female experience. You know it and I know it. And for me to talk about the female experience, I'd have to talk about it from the white point of view. And it's different from the black point of view. And, it, and that's unfortunate because we aren't in the same position. I was married to a white man, damn, damn. <laughs> <sighs> Took me a long time to get him, but I got him. <laughs> and he looked like Marlon Brando when I married him. By the time he died 59 years later, he looked like Telly Savalas. <laughs> 59 years of living with me will do that to you. White women say, I, 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 I'm angry at white women. And now you're thinking, oh, anger is such an unproductive emotion. If you aren't angry about what's happening in this country, you're probably white. And you're probably male. Because it doesn't bother you a lot because it isn't happening to you. White women make really big mistakes. I'll never forget the woman who walked up to me, the white woman who walked up to me and said, I'm not prejudiced. I don't dislike blacks. When I see one, I just think, there but for the grace of God go I. And I was furious. And I don't think she has said that since then. <laughs> because I don't think her world is ever going to be the same. Because at that moment, she experienced a brain change. <laughs> you can change the brain. They've interviewed students, my former students, who are now middle-aged people, who went through the blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise. In 1970, a group from the BBC came out and was doing a, a documentary about science of the brain. They interviewed two of those, those middle-aged men and asked them how it felt before, how they thought before, how they thought during, how they thought after the exercise. And at the end of that interview, they said, we have proven here that you can change the brain. Now, if you can change the brain of a nine-year-old white child in a day, what do you do to the brains of people of, black, of other colors if you abuse them psychologically, mentally, emotionally, and physically for a lifetime? 
What do you do with nine-year-old black children? Do you change their brains in a negative way? Yes, you do. And we're doing it on a daily basis. We know exactly how to do it. A psychologist said to me last week, and he, she used one of those four or five syllable terms, and she said, we've known that for years. I said, then by God, why aren't you telling it to elementary teachers? That's right. Because they need to know this. They need to know that the way they treat children will change those brains in either a positive or a negative way. We have changed the brains of women from birth. We subject them to, you're less than, you can't do it. And, it, it, you know, I'm real sick of hearing people say, to make America great again. Because that word again means, go back to the 50s. There you go. Which was real good for white men, but wasn't worth a damn for people of color and women. You need to know right. that. And that's what this fool wants us to do. And when you hear his mentor say, we're going to deconstruct the government. Mm -hmm. Deconstruct the government? take away the things that are valuable for all of us? No, 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 you cannot allow this to happen. You have to realize that deconstruct the government means take away Social Security. Mm -hmm. And uh, how many people do you know who are making enough money, who could put money away in a personal savings account, as W wanted us to do? Remember W? Yeah. W? I did this at a college one day, and the kid said, hey, you can't do that any, many, anymore, Miss Ellie. I said, why didn't, what do you not? What do you mean? They said, that means read between the lines. <laughs> <laughs> After I said that, and then I said that at the next two colleges I went to, the Bushes quit doing this when they got up on the stage, because all of a sudden they were exposed. People, indecent exposure is what we're living with right now when our president, number 45, says, Make America great again. In other words, take it back to the 50s. I don't want to go back to the 50s. I don't have that much time. I can't afford to wait, spend the next 40 years trying to fix right. this situation. Right. We need to fix it now. But first you have to recognize That's what right. it is. You have to recognize that racism is ignorance. It is pure, unadulterated ignorance. And I don't care whether you're a red ace racist or a white one or a black one or a yellow one or a brown one. If you're a racist, you're not thinking and you're being ignorant, get over it. But, and, and you gotta remember, so Jane just said, change the brain. Go back to media. When you are, when you have been pounded, every single, all the, it was a big, it was big news three weeks ago, the Bachelorette is going to have its first black Bachelorette. Oh my God. <laughs> We're gonna get to see a black woman pick somebody to fall in love with. First, y'all notice, they did not start with a black bachelor. This ain't about male domination. America has always said, okay, now we got to, figure, we got to watch this stuff. Let's just watch it with a black woman first but we are not gonna have a show where a black man might be picking a white woman on that show. I'm just trying to let y'all understand how this works. Now, understand this, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to talk about how images get pounded. You deal with Hollywood. When George Lucas did, when he made um, um, Red Tails. Now this is George Lucas. This is Mr. Star Wars. This is a man who sold his company for four billion dollars to Disney. George Lucas goes to the seven Hollywood studios, top seven, the big seven. I'm George Lucas. I'm the man. I'm Mr. Star Wars. I want to take red tails. They went, ain't no white heroes. He said, I'm sorry. Um, there are heroes in my movie. They said, we know. He said, but, they said, but the, all the white people are bad. He said, cause it's a true story and the white people, <laughs> the white people were bad. And they said, no, there are no white heroes in this movie. All seven passed. That was another movie uh, that was called the, Earth, the Specialist. So uh, actor Brian White was on my show. He told me this here. So this movie, every studio in Hollywood loved this movie. It was all these hijinks in a hospital with these doctors. Uh, and they loved it. All, every studio read the script. Oh, we want to make this movie. Until they met with the scriptwriter, 
And then they realized that this was based upon a true story of a group of black doctors in a hospital. Every studio lost interest. Because what Hollywood has said is, uh, Hollywood, if you want to read, uh, if you want to read a book called An Empire of Their Own, How the Jews Invented Hollywood, it was a phenomenal book, uh, won numerous awards. And the reason that book is important, I go back to building a house. I like to read how industries were created from the beginning to understand why they're the way they are today. And so uh, the book is called you know, How the Jews, uh, me, An Empire of Their Own, How the Jews Invented Hollywood, which is really a phenomenal book because it details that the American dream was actually created by Hollywood. And so what we call the American dream was never the American dream. It was what largely uh, Eastern European immigrants created because that was their image of America, which actually became the image of America. It's a trip. <laughs> so Hollywood television is determining what you think and what you see and how you feel. So when Hollywood says, we can't have a movie of all black heroes, what does that tell you? When Hollywood says, oh, no, 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 we, we can't have a black lead of a movie, we gotta have a white co-star in the movie as well. These, these things are happening in so-called liberal Hollywood. Do understand that. Do, do understand what the movie 21, the movie 21 was made about these group of MIT students who went to Vegas and beat the system. Those were largely Asian students. But in the movie, there were only two Asian students. The lead characters was a white male and a white female, and there were no black folks who were on that team. You have to understand why media does this. Media is still appealing to white nationalism. It's appealing to no. So when you hear mainstream, mainstream is appealing to that white family. You always hear it, you used to hear it in Peoria. Okay, where is Peoria? Illinois. So they love saying the flyover states. Whenever you hear media say, we are appealing to Peoria, we are appealing to middle America, what they are saying is we are appealing to the middle of the section that is largely white to the tune of 80 to 90 percent, and that's who we are targeting with our movies and our television shows. That's what's happening, and the same thing. That's impacting people of color economically because if you don't get the marketing, your movie only makes 40 million when you could have made 400 million, then you don't have the ability to be able to create wealth. This thing comes back to money, folks, and I gotta give you this. If you've gone to Washington, D.C., there's only one federal agency that shares a lawn with the White House. One, Treasury. They can, you can walk 100 steps outside of the side of the Treasury Building and you're in the East Wing. Power, White House, money, Treasury. Money, power. Everything in America comes, America comes down to money. And so when you read the book, The Other Half Never Told, the reason we even have capitalism in America is because of free labor. The 13 colonies were afraid the British were going to get rid of, going to abolish slavery. That was the only economy we had. If you read Gerald Horn's book on uh, the slave rebellion in 1776, one of the reasons we had the American Revolution, because that was a fear. You have to deal with racism in America and money because they go together. And how many of you would like to have some money? <laughs> Green is my favorite color. Damn Skippy. We are almost done. I know. She sounds so relieved, doesn't she? <laughs> You're going to get out of this pretty soon now. We're going to take it. a few minutes. I, I want to face locally now. We've talked sort of the macro level. Um, you're in Ann Arbor, which has been described as a liberal bubble. Ah. You're, you're at the University of Michigan. That's why we Michigan, say that, that bullshit right there. What has, which has also been described as a liberal bubble. Ann Arbor votes blue. How do the folks in this audience have this conversation when we, because we're talking about the Women of Color Task Force and its um, members and its allies. How do they go back into their workplace and have the conversations and share the information that they heard here? How do you talk to them about what their next steps are? People always say to me, well, you brought us lots of problems, but you didn't bring us any solutions. I'm a white woman. I don't have the solution for everyone, but you need to go to my website and download the printed learning materials that are there. Because the first is a set of, 
uh, typical statements that white folks make that think they aren't being racist. How many of you have had the experience of having some white fool walk up to you and say, when I see you, I don't see you black? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And what are you supposed to do? I know I see you and you white. Yeah, but, but <laughs> you're allowed to right, see white. Right. You're allowed to see white. It's a good thing to see white. When somebody says to me, and people do this to me all the time, they say, I'm colorblind. Always white women, I'm colorblind. I don't see color. And I say, I knew that before you told me, because if you weren't colorblind, you wouldn't have worn that shirt with those pants. <laughs> when somebody says, I will never forget Linda Guillory, tall, aggressive, black Linda Guillory. This white woman went up to her on her high heels. And you know how women walk, white women walk on high heels. They're trying to run away from their hemorrhoids. And there's, <laughs> because they shouldn't be wearing those high heels, you know? They're up to you, and this woman said, Linda, I've known you so long, I don't see you black anymore. And I stepped back, because I thought, oh Lord, there's gonna be bloodshed here. <laughs> and I've gotta wear this suit tomorrow, and I didn't wanna get it covered with blood. So I stepped back, and Linda Guillory said, I think you have an eye problem. Let's make an appointment with an optometrist so that you can get over this problem. People, this is a lie. You're supposed to take it as a compliment when some white fool says she doesn't see the color of your skin. This is ignorance. And most of you have had this experience, unless I'm very much mistaken. How many of you have been the only black student in a classroom? And yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. And had the white teacher say, how do black people feel about this? And how many of you black people know exactly like, how every them. black person feels? <laughs> let me text them. Yeah, yeah. People, it is sheer ignorance. It is not white privilege. It is sheer ignorance. The white privilege papers are based on the idea of race. Because of my race, I can do this and this and this. No, because of my ignorance, I will do this and this and this. People, this is about ignorance. We need to re-educate all of us. Don't put up with it. I have a, okay. Here's, your story. here's, wanna, here's wait, how you change on. it. I, I'd like to talk about allies, and then I'll throw it over to you. So there, there, there are people in this audience who are also working with um, peers, colleagues who are allies. And one of the statements well, that I love allies? on your site is that this, someone might say, um, I'm with you, but no matter what I say, no matter what I do, it doesn't suit you. You're never satisfied. As far as I'm concerned, I'm an ally, but I can't do anything right. Well, you, re you need to realize that if you, you make the plural of allies, it's come to allies. <laughs> they're thinking, they're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> we will call ourselves allies, but we don't want you to come to our house or to go to church with us. And we don't want you to think that your son might be good enough to walk with our daughters. Except Great. in his case, and he sure as hell isn't good enough, but it has nothing to do with the color of his skin. I'm already taken. Yeah, I know, I know you are. People, if you want to call yourself an ally, if you're a white person and you want to call yourself an ally, first you have to learn about what it is you're doing. You get, look at those white folks, you look at those typical statements and see how many of them are the ones that you have made. And then go to the clarifications of those statements. How they are perceived, instead of just what they say, see how they are perceived. Then, if you want to make a difference, white folks, if you really want to be an ally, then go to the set of commitments to combat racism. 18 things that white people can do in their own environment to deal with their own problems. Now somebody's gonna say, racism is a societal problem. Societies are made of individuals. We as individuals could change our behaviors and that would change, that we, you would create brain change in those around you. Now, with number 45, creating brain change is difficult because first you have to have a brain. I'm not sure about this person, but he needs a brain change. We all need a brain change to realize that we have been lied to, and if you want to talk about black history, you have to talk about 4,000 years before the birth of Christ. Minimum for a women. Don't say amen, say a women. You, <laughs> you have to talk about the real black history, which is the history of civilization, and the, the history of the United States of America is not the history of civilization, people. There was something long before this, and there will be something long after this, okay? One of my favorite movies is Malcolm X. 
And I love that scene when they're at the police station and Brother Johnson has been beaten by the cops. And then they demand that for them to call the ambulance. So the ambulance comes and they're wheeling Brother Johnson out of the hole into the ambulance. And then the white cop comes up to Malcolm X and he goes, okay, you got what you wanted. He said, now you can leave. And he gets, and Malcolm X says, no, I'm not satisfied. On to the hospital. I love that I'm not satisfied. In 1967, Dr. King wrote his book, Chaos or Community, Where Do We Go From Here? And in that book, he said, it did not cost America much for us to be able to sit at a lunch counter. Didn't cost America a lot for us to be able to swim in a swimming pool. Didn't cost America a lot for us to be able to go into a park or to a hotel. He said, the real question is, will America now write that check uh, where it's going to cost them something. He said, uh, and that's going to be a big check to her, to Jane's point earlier when she said, uh, uh, righting the wrongs, uh, seeking justice. But this is what Dr. King said, and, and there's no person in this room who should not have a copy of that book because also that was his worst selling book for a reason. He said in that very book, even our well, white allies will not be with us. He said, because they will say, y'all have gotten enough. That's it. I go back to Reconstruction. The reason Reconstruction ended, because when they got to the sixth and the seventh year, white, um, white Americans said, okay, we, 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 we about done with this. I mean, we've done enough. Folks, uh, slavery, Emancipation Proclamation, 1863, correct? First slaves, first folks, 1619. Uh, subtract 1863 from 1619. What does that give you? What, 244? So six or seven years of change. All right, that's enough, but 244 years of actual slavery. We had 13 years of the freedom movement. Timmy Till Kill, August 28th, 1955, Sparks Montgomery, December 1st, 1955, 381 days that goes through, and I use the mark of Dr. King's death uh, in the Poor People's Campaign, which took place later that year, so let's say 13 years, same thing. So you go from 1877 all the way up through 1968, and then people say, all right, 13 years, that's about enough. White Americans have always told black folks, y'all satisfied yet? If you go and actually study MLK, not listen to one speech, the I have a dream speech, don't listen to the last three minutes of his dream top, uh, meant to the mountaintop speech in, on, on April 4th, 1968, April 3rd at Mason Temple. Listen to the entire 43 minute and 16 second speech. What you will discover is that King rarely ever talked about equality. King always talked about freedom. He wanted freedom. The freedom he wanted for African Americans, the moment they come out of the womb to have the exact same rights, privileges as anybody else. In fact, he wanted that black child in the womb to have the exact same thing because one of the reasons why you have black kids who are not as developed as largely white kids in America is because white mothers have prenatal care. A lot of black mothers do not. So the moment a black child comes out, they're, they're malnourished and they're, they're already behind the white child and they were born at the exact same time. And so this notion of satisfied, no, I'm not satisfied. I likely will die not satisfied. I will not be satisfied until I get to do the exact same thing white people do and not get shot. That's freedom. So we can't, there's, so we can't say, well, but, but when are you going to be happy? When we are fully free, where we don't need a law. So y'all understand, white folks have not had to have a law passed to allow them to do something. That's a law. That's equality. Freedom means you get it the moment you're born. So how do you change it? You cannot change this until you change who you're talking to. This is a voluntary environment, meaning this event. You chose to come here. 
even though you applied to the university, you had no control over who else applied. So, I, so, we, so you said liberal Ann Arbor. No, that's bullshit. And the reason I'm saying that, because some of the most wonderful, nice bigots I've met have been liberals. <laughs> and so you have to say, one, who do I eat with? I might be at University of Michigan, and we, oh, I'm, I know some people, but who do I ask to go to lunch with? Who do I invite to my house for dinner? What conversations do we have? Who are the authors on my bookshelf? The books that Jane mentioned, are any of those books on my bookshelf? The books that I mentioned, are any of those books on my bookshelf? Uh, where do I vacation? Who do I talk to? All of that impacts it. If you're living in your white liberal world, and you say, I got a couple of black friends who occasionally pop in, then that means that the conversations that you're having are limited conversations, and you are actually reinforcing your individual narratives in your conversations. That's where you start. That doesn't require a university mandate. It doesn't require that. That requires you actually saying, uh, you know what, we're gonna add some color to this. Uh, because we're gonna, we're gonna have some different conversations. Reverend Jim Wallace does this. When he goes to somebody's houses, he looks at their DVD collections, their book collections, their artwork, the pictures on their walls, and he says, who do you dine with? And that's what, now the same thing happens if you're black. And a black student at Texas A&M came to me and she said, you know, I was here, you talk about Texas A&M and you loved it? And I said, yes, I did. I had a great time there. And she says, but, yeah, but, you know, we got these white students, they won't even speak. I said, well, do you speak? She's like, what do you mean? I was like, just, how did come out your mouth? <laughs> At Texas A&M, we have a tradition, we say howdy. We don't say how, we say howdy. That's an A&M tradition. I go, do you say howdy? I don't like saying howdy. Well, why your ass here? We have the tradition. No. No, 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 no. F follow me here. She's a black student coming to Texas A&M, and she's like, I don't like the traditions, but that's all we have the universal traditions. We have tons of traditions. So you're mad about the traditions, which is the aggy thing, whether you're black or not. I said, okay, so when you're at lunch, I'm curious, you ever just sat down with some white people? She's like, what do you mean? I said, well, have you ever just taken your train, walked up, say, how y'all doing? Can I sit here? Y'all mind if I sit here? She goes, no. I said, so you're asking white students to do what you won't do. So you want white students to come over and sit with you, but you won't go sit over. Like, I know right now on this campus, I had one of the sisters on my show today. Uh, so you got some black students who want a safe space for black folks to be able to organize uh, when it comes to social justice, okay? I get that, but see, I'm different. I'm gonna go organize in the middle of a group of white people. Because I want them to overhear our conversation. I, I, I want y'all to think about what I just said. I want them to see us walking through. I want them to go, what are they doing? Because if I am in a place where it's just black people, then I am reinforcing a conversation and a narrative. No, I want to make some white people in liberal Ann Arbor uncomfortable with my presence because see, my presence may also cause them to begin to say, did y'all hear what they were just talking about? And what invariably happens is somebody goes, well, can I learn more? Can I hear more? See, that's just one. Reach one, teach one. That's where we are scared. We are looking for safe spaces when what we need are unsafe spaces. We need folks who are, un who are willing to get out of their comfort zones, to talk to people, to challenge people. And it might require you say, y'all mind if I sit here? And invariably, and a conversation may start. And the last thing here, because this is how it works. As a student, sophomore, we were playing pool, it was two o'clock in the morning. I don't know how the conversation started. So some white guy began to talk to me and my brother. I don't know where he was from, and here's what ended up happening. He told us a story, and he said, and he just, I don't know how he broke down, I don't know how it came up, but he said when he was a kid, they were playing football, and some black kid got mad, and took the ball and went home. <laughs> and he said, I have, that's, I have not liked black people since. <laughs> Because they got too many balls. <laughs> Y'all didn't hear that one. <laughs> he didn't hear um, that one. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> I said, now, I didn't act a fool, getting mad. You know, I was like, what the hell this fool saying? I said, I said, I said, bro, I said, let me help you out. So, you have not been liking black people all these years because a black kid took your ball and went home, right? He says, yes. I said, you do know in a neighborhood right now, it's a group of black kids playing. 
and a black kid got pissed off and took a black kid's ball and went home. <laughs> I don't think the group of black people no longer like black people <laughs> because that black kid took their ball. I said, I'm telling you the story because that's what little kids do. They take damn balls and go home. I said, so I need you to understand that. And we began to have a dialogue. He literally, for eight years, was not liking black people because what one incident happened as a kid. Why does that matter? Because in the same town, when I was working at the TV station, KBTX, Bryan College Station, Jeff Braun, yes, I'm calling his name, I applied for the weekend sports anchor job there, and he did not give me the job because he had a run-in with somebody black several years earlier. I did not get the job because of a run-in he had with a black man. Everybody in the station, the sports director, the assistant sports director, the 5 p.m. producer, the 6 p.m. producer, the executive producer all said, Roland is the best intern at this station. He should get the job. But he said, no, his own friends told me, Roland, he's not going to hire you because of that. And then he hired a boy, my classmate, nice guy, John Oakley, who I ran rings around. Why am I saying that? Because that same kid as a sophomore who didn't like black people because of one incident as a child is going to grow up to be in corporate America and he's going to have one incident. He's not going to hire somebody black because of the one incident. If we did not, now I don't know if he kept stayed the same, but if we didn't have that conversation at two o'clock in the morning, I don't know if he might be still walking around with the same feelings. I believe though, because we had the conversation, he might have had a change of opinion. If you sit in your safe space and don't talk to anybody, then you can't change anybody. But here's, wait a minute, I gotta yep. say something here. And I, I want you to say what you wanna right. say, and then I also want you to offer a goodbye. Oh, okay. You need to realize that when he talked about what somebody did as a kid, number 45 spends all his time in his child ego state. Boom. You have three ego states, child, parent, and adult. He spends his time in his child ego so state. High daddy tree. Until we get him out of his child ego state and out of his parent ego state in which he says, you're fired, we will not have an adult in the White House. You need to realize that. We have a man who was a case of an arrested development. When they kicked him out of military academy, he hadn't had the full course. So he is still in that ridiculous situation of being in the beginning of the training. He is, you have to understand that this man cannot think without somebody telling him what to think. And anybody who tells him that what we need to do is deconstruct this government Boom. does not have your best interests at Boom. heart, and he doesn't have my best interests at heart, and I want, I want you to realize what is really happening. It isn't because he's 70, but I watched the head of the Department of Commerce this morning, and let me tell you, I know we old people know a lot, but when you can't walk across the room without problems. You ought not to be the head of a major department of the government. You got it? Come on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, mm. <laughs> I'm not an ageist, but neither am I a fool. What, do you, what else do you want? <laughs> Other than for me I, to shut up. I want you to tell them thank you and goodbye, and then I'm going to bring Catherine up because she has something special. Oh, okay. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank there you, you go, Jane. Thank you all. and nobody else. <laughs> okay, thank you very, very much. Um, you guys can hold on for a moment, don't run out. Don't run out. Church, Hello, come back. Wait, wait for the benediction. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on behalf of the Women of Color Task Force, first we would like to thank our moderator, Professor Raman Means Coleman. 
she had an extremely tough job today. And I believe that she did it with grace, dignity, and control. So on behalf of the Women of Color Task Force, I would like to, we would like to thank her and offer her with this token gift. And I'll tell you, because I always sit outside and I hate when someone gets a gift and you don't know what it is. It's a block M made out of the wood on the University of Michigan campus whenever we cut down trees and we erect buildings. We take that wood and we repurpose it. And it's a block M and it's a paperweight, it's about this big, that she will have out of some of the Michigan wood. Okay? Then, on behalf of Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Jr., the Cesar Chavez Rosa Parks Visiting Professorship, we offer this certificate that certifies that Jane Elliott served as a King Chavez Parks Visiting Professor at the University of Michigan and is hereby granted all the rights, honors, and privileges thereunto appertaining in witness whereof the seals of the state of Michigan and the University of Michigan and the signatures of the university officers thereof are hereunto affixed. And it's signed by our president, Mark Schischel, and our vice provost and chief diversity officer, I cannot read the signature, Robert Sellers. It's a beautiful signature. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Oh, thank you. That's, that's wonderful. Thanks. Thank you. Then we have a Martin Luther King Jr. Cesar Chavez Rosa Parks Visiting Professorship for Roland Martin. He has served as a King Chavez Parks Visiting Professor at the University of Michigan and is hereby granted all the rights, honors, and privileges thereunto appertaining in witness there whereof the seals of the state of Michigan and the University of Michigan and the signatures of the university officers thereof are hereunto affixed. <laughs> this is signed by our president Mark Schischel and our vice provost and chief diversity officer Robert Sellers. You know his name now. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. I appreciate it. Thank you.